Hi everyone, this is Ashnut Kothari here. So in this particular video, I'm going to be discussing the indicative solutions or, or the method, methodology for CM1A for IA July 2022 session. So before we start on with the discussion of the paper, uh, you know, do like this video if you find it useful. Uh, do share your comments as well and uh, definitely make sure to subscribe to our channel so that uh, you all are notified with, you know, whatever future content we come out with. Also, the batches at Fanatics has started for the IEI December 2022 session. Classes are available in offline mode, online mode, as well as pre-recorded lectures are being provided. Along with that, to ensure that students have an extremely good preparation, they are extremely well prepared so that you know they can have, uh, you know, they can deliver pretty good results. All sort of preparatory resources from our end will be provided, ensuring that a student has access to you know all the key resources. So in case you are looking to join the classes to increase your understanding of actual science, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Now, uh, firstly, to begin with, uh, you know, uh, how the CM1 paper was, I will say it was a relatively difficult paper. Uh, not that key, all questions were very difficult or, you know, a large number of them were extremely difficult, but just the pattern. Uh, the less number of MCQs compared to the previous sessions and you know the few questions involved enormous amount of calculation and doing that uh, you know especially while tapping it out on MS Word is a challenge so relatively yes uh, I, I would say the CM1A paper was challenging so let's hope uh, you know that uh, most of you have uh, you know pretty good results and you all are able to do well in CM1B to maybe you know compensate uh, for not so good performance in case you, you know, experience that in CM1A. So this particular video is going to be a relatively short one, I will say. Uh, for a few questions, I'm just going to discuss, you know, the potential equations, uh, not going into the specific calculations, having just a little bit positive of time due to uh, the commitments with respect to classes and all. So it, it's crazy time right now, just a few weeks uh, before the examinations for the September session starts. So yeah, I have tried to, you know, calculate wherever possible uh, in certain few cases where, you know, I'll say it's fairly straightforward uh, to perform the calculation. I have just written on the equation. So starting with question number one, liabilities and assets have been given, uh, you know, various cash flows has been given. Uh, part one is to, you know, find the values of X and Y so that the first and second conditions of Reddington immunization theory are fulfilled. Again, keep in mind, uh, in case you come across any sort of errors or any sort of numerical errors in our video, please feel free to reach out to us through comments section. We will definitely take a look at it and come up with rectifications in the case required. So all of you know uh, who are watching this particular video, make sure that you do watch the comments section as well. So that in case uh, any sort of errors had been there uh, at the time of recording of this video, we would be uh, pushing in the rectifications through the comments section. So for part one, uh, this is the equation which we are having for PV liabilities, PV assets. And, you know, on further calculating it, uh, it boils down on, you know, it reduces to this set of two equations. Similarly, we have it for P, uh, you know, to calculate, let's say the first derivative, I find out the derivative of liabilities, then the derivative of assets. And then, you know, I have two equations solving both of them. The answer which I was getting was X to the 1.677477 y to be 67.452420. Now, as for part two, uh, to calculate the convexity, again, what you'll need to do is, you know, first find uh, the second derivative and, you know, and then uh, using the formula for convexity, you know, substitute the values of x and y over there and you can find it. So I have not performed that particular sort of calculation over here, but you can see using these equations, the earlier one, PV, you can, uh, you have the PV dash as well. You can again differentiate it to get the numerator part of convexity and proceed uh, for the calculation part. So I will say this question again, extremely tricky. Uh, had I been solving the paper uh, in examination, this probably would have been the last questions, uh, you know, which I would have attempted because although on the face of it, there is nothing difficult over here. I mean, it's fairly straightforward applying the formulas, but the calculation part, which is the key is extremely time consuming, I'll say, and at a point of time, the chances to make some error highly increases. Part three, state the limitations and practical difficulties of Reddington's immunization theory. It's a standard book work. Question number two, again, it's a direct book work theoretical part, uh, you know, I'll say. Then uh, question number three, it's a 10 marks. It's coming from basically, let's say the first chapter principles of actual modeling. 
So it's direct book work. Then for question number four, this is what I have for you all. Question number four. Yes. So this is the method using the uniform uh, distribution of death method as well as uh, the constant force of mortality. Note that I have, uh, you know, skipped uh, a certain step in constant force of mortality and the answers again till uh, six decimal places is almost the same only. The difference lies in the seventh decimal place. That is as expected. So this is question four. Again, uh, I'll say scoring one. Then for question five, uh, you know, there are two parts to it. One is the majority benefit. Second is the, uh, the return of premiums. Now, one way is, you know, you can perform the entire calculation and come up with the answer. And then the trick over here is given the options, we have four options over here. The easier part over here is just to calculate the majority benefit, which will be 50,000 V to the power 20, 20 P select 45 plus another term, which is the return of premiums where there will be an increasing assurance term. So, uh, you know, for this part question five, I just calculated the majority benefit and it was coming out to be 20,544. Then there will be another component, a positive component, which is basically for the death benefit as well, which is the return of premiums. So therefore my answer has to be D only because A, B and C is something which will not surface over here. So, you know, again, a shortcut way over here is it's four marks. Ideally, you could think it should take eight marks, eight minutes or 10 minutes. This can be literally done in one minute itself. And it's since it's 4%, you know, directly 50,000 D65 by D select 45. So it, it should take maximum minute and, you know, students can directly offer option number D over here. And then question number six, uh, this I will say just slightly different question. Originally, you know, under the old curriculum in CT1, there was a particular chapter stochastic model of investment rates. So there is some sort of relation to, you know, uh, that particular chapter, but again, even as per the current CM1 syllabus, students should have been able to get this right. Not all, although directly from any chapter, I will say, but underlying concepts almost remains the same. So over here, what is happening is you're buying a particular bond of 1 lakh nominal, which pays coupons at the rate of 4% per annum. And it's reading that 105. So the cash flows will be typically, you know, what, uh, let's say, uh, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, and then finally it will be 1 lakh 9,000. 4,000 at time one, 4,000 at time two, 4,000 at time three, 1 lakh 9,000 at time four, where time zero is nothing but first than 2022. You need to find the accumulated value of these investments at time four. And they have given, uh, you know, the interest rates, which are being uh, applicable in specific years. So this is going to be the equation. 1 lakh 5,000, the redemption value, it's at time four, plus 4,000. Again, this is at time four. 4,000, this is at time three, I multiplied by 1.045, which is the, you know, the mean rate earned in the fourth year. Then again, this 4,000 corresponds to payment at time two, and then I'm accumulating at 4.5% and 6.0%. And then finally, this is 4,000 at time one. Calculating, I'm getting, uh, you know, to the nearest integer as 1,22,285. And as per the options, this shall be 1,22,300. So it becomes option A over here. Then next, what we have is question number seven, uh, where we buy the bond or the bill for 96.5. Uh, we sell it for 98, achieving a return of 4% per annum effective. So this is the solution. 96.5 into 1.04 to the party is equal to 98, where T is basically in years because it's 4% per annum. So I get T as this. And if I multiply this with 365, then I'll be getting 143.54. So it comes out to be 144 days. Some of you might have taken 365.25. Again, that will be leading to an answer of 144 days over here itself. So it's option B. Question number eight, three bonds redeemable at INR 103 per 100 nominal can be redeemed in one, two, and three years and pay annual coupons in arrears at 6% per annum. Calculate the implied one year and two years portraits if price of each bond is 97 per 100 nominal. Again, the three-year bond is something which we will not require. Uh, we can just do with the one-year and the two-year bond. So 6% is the coupon rate, 103% is the redemption rate. So this is the working. 97 is equal to 103 plus 6, 109 divided by 1 plus by 1. Solving this, I'll get uh, the spot uh, the one-year spot rate of interest. 
and then uh, using the two year bond 97 is equal to 6 at time 1 divided by 1 plus y1 plus 109 at time 2 divided by 1 plus y2 whole square. On solving it, you shall be getting the answer as 9.049083%, which is my two year spot rate of interest. Then question number nine, a loan had been taken, uh, you know, so on. First part is calculate the initial loan amount. Part two is the capital repaid in first installment and part three is the capital component and the interest component of seventh repayment. So the loan amount, uh, you all can see the expression from first principles have started. Uh, this is the discounting factor because the first payment is after 10 months. It's a thousand increasing by 5% and it's at an interval of, you know, four months, four by 12 is coming out as one by three. So V to the power one by three. And the last term over here is 1001.05 uh, to the power 14, V to the power 56 by 12. It's nothing but a geometric progression. This comes out as the expression and the value is coming out to be 17,691.77. Now part two, uh, they have just asked for the actually capital repaid part. What I've done is I've started with the interest. This comes out to be the interest. Note that the payments are every four months. Right. And the first payment is after 10 months. So we need to find the interest uh, for the first 10 months over here, which is 880.27. I subtract this from 1000, which is the first installment. So I get the capital repaid portion. Part three, I need to find the capital and interest of the seventh payment. So I find the loan outstanding after six payments and after seven payments. And then using the difference, I get the capital repaid. If I, you know, subtract that from the seventh payment, I might get the interest alternatively, you know. I have the loan outstanding after six payments. Using this also, I can directly get the interest component. So there are multiple ways to address this. This is the answer. Capital repaid is 1078.43. Interest is 261.67. And within brackets, I've shown the methodology as well to calculate it. So, uh, and this fairly took me a long time, question number nine, because I was making some of the other uh, silly errors. And, you know, I was trying to uh, cross check my answers as well using two different scenarios and I was not getting it. So this took me relatively uh, a lot more time that I had anticipated. Had that not been the case, you know, or the further questions I would have, you know, attempted to solve all of them. So generally I try to, you know, get these papers done within, let's say one and a half hours or maybe two hours at max. Of all of them, I'll say CM1 takes most amount of time given the extreme amount of calculations required. So uh, for the later questions, you know, what I've done is just written down mostly the equations, taken few values from tables, not the complete answer, but you'll get the essence of it. So for question number 10, uh, as long as both of them are alive, you know, an annuity of 2 lakh, then there's a revisionary annuity payable to female on the death of male, which is of 1 lakh, then another revisionary annuity of 1 lakh 50,000 payable to male on the death of female. So this becomes, which I have written as equation one over here. It's not minus one. This is basically equation one. And then the survival benefit, if any one of them is alive, that is if the last survivor status is active, a payment of 50,000 is made after 10 years and 20 years. This is equation two. So now for equation one, uh, it will just open it up where you use the fact that uh, AX given by is AY minus AXY. You will get this particular result. Using actual tables, you'll get the values, you know, there it's for advance. Remember that earlier is nothing but advance minus one. So you'll get the values of earlier as well from the actual tables. Then you can put in the values and calculate it. As for 10p, 60, 55, you know, you can do it single plus single minus joint and, you know, directly calculate this using actual tables. Then uh, next, which we have is question number 11, which is, I will say, uh, theoretical part, uh, direct book work. Then question number 12, which I'll say is a slightly dicey question, I'll say. Uh, so, uh, because I feel that part two, I mean, the quantum of marks given does not justify the amount of effort required. Could be that, you know, I might have been missing something right now. I have been thinking uh, for quite some time, uh, you know, with this question as well. I, I just feel that uh, part two specifically is overmarked, but then, uh, you know, I'll have to wait for the examiner report to come out to see, you know, if there was anything missed out. In case you all feel that, you know, the answers which I've come up with is not correct. There should be something else. Please, you know, feel free to reach out to us to the comments section. So, you know, what's happening is uh, here, what is happening? There's an individual who is age 35. Term is 13 years. And uh, this particular individual continues to pay a premium of 50,000 as long as this person is alive. And after 13 years, the particular child will get the majority benefit of 9 lakh. Note that if the person dies in between, uh, he or she does not have to pay any further premiums, obviously. And uh, the, you know, the student or the particular child will still be getting the majority amount of 9 lakh. Just that the further premium does not have to be paid. 
So as per my understanding, uh, the product is basically that after 13 years, the majority of benefit of 9 lakh is kind of fixed only, right? Whether the, uh, the person who has taken out a loan, the parent, whether he or she is alive or not, uh, you know, we are assuming that the child later on has negligent mortality. So we assume that the child is going to remain alive only. So basically the 9 lakh part is something which is kind of, uh, you know, we could think it to be fixed only. It's certain payment. What is uncertain is the quantum of premiums which this individual has to make. As long as this person is alive, he or she will continue to pay it. So part one is you to check whether the overall returns are more than 4% or not. So if the person, let's say, you know, assumes is, uh, let's say, you know, alive for all the 13 years, then the maximum premium which this person would be paying will be, you know, 50,000 into 30 and these will be payable in advance. So if I find the accumulated value, 50,000 SDU 13 at the rate 4%, I'm getting out to, you know, 8,64,595. In fact, the majority benefit being paid out is 9 lakh. So definitely the returns over here is, you know, more than 4% only. Again, I haven't assumed any sort of expenses while performing this calculation because in the structure of the question, they have given these details after part two. So for part one, I have not considered any sort of expenses at all. Then part two, calculate the gross premium reserves just after the life insured attains the age of 43 years. So the policy was taken out when the person was of age 35. So we need to basically find reserves at time eight. Uh, interest rate mortality has been given. Commission is 2.5%. Renewal expense 500. Uh, you know, this is incurred end of each policy year. No surrenders, no expense inflation. Assume negligible mortality for beneficiary. So we assume that the bene beneficiary is going to remain alive itself. So this is the equation which I was getting for 12 part 2. You know, 9 lakh, which is kind of fixed. Remaining term is 5 years. So V to the power 5 is a discounting factor. Then this is the renewal expense part, uh, you know, commission part. Then this is the renewal expense part. And then from it, I subtract minus PADU 43, 5. So again, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, whether I'm missing something, you know, when I'm writing down this particular term because 11 marks have been given. So it looks... Uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be any need of that uh, 9 lakh. So uh, we'll have to see, you know, if I'm missing out something or not. Then part three, you know, calculate the DSR. Again, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, there is no sum assured uh, as in uh, payable on death. So, you know, that becomes, let's say zero. So it's basically, uh, you know, zero minus the reserves part itself. It will come straightforward from there itself. Then part four is, you know, if the policy holder were allowed to change premium frequency to monthly. With all other terms remaining the same, explain whether the reserves will increase or decrease. So everything remains the same. It's just that uh, the you know the premiums will be paid at a uh, more frequently. But instead of paying the entire premium at the beginning of first year, now what will happen is it will be paid at the beginning of each month. Suppose if it's monthly, so your EPV is gonna re get reduced for the premiums. So therefore, you'll need the company will need to maintain higher amount of reserves because all the terms other remain the same, but the EPO of premiums is decreasing. Then part five is, uh, you know, uh, surrender option is there and they need to, you know, kind of describe how the reserves would change about. Part six is what is the difference between the term lapse and uh, surrender. And then finally, again, which is fairly direct book work. And then final part, define a multiple decrement model. Again, two marks, fairly book work. So overall, uh, you know, not much MCQs were there, probably just three questions or four questions of MCQ around 10 or 12 marks or so. So compared to the last few papers, relatively it was less. So uh, overall a challenging paper, I'll say, in my opinion, this cm one Let's hope that, you know, all of you uh, still are able to score well and pass the paper. Again, don't forget to like this video if you found it useful and, uh, uh, you know, do subscribe to our channel so that you are updated with all the latest content we keep on releasing. Thanks everyone.